story that uh, Goran and Nico is going to tell us. And without further ado, I'm going to leave the floor to them. So uh, take it away. Thank you, Dimitar. It's great to be here and to deliver this session, which was a great pleasure actually to, to create because it's our success story about uh, governance in teams, especially on the topic how we managed to um, uh, get the team's creation process in an automated way without limiting the business productivity of the users. So it was one project in our company which uh, finished with a great success. So I think that it will be interesting also for the attendees to hear to hear about this um, this topic. So let's try and go from the beginning, the agenda, and we are going to say a couple of words about us, then about our user experience with Microsoft 365. So we are going to cover a topics from our experience in BOSART, but also because we have experience in the past also working as a consultant. We are going to share some common um, approaches, um, tips, tricks, or maybe frequently made mistakes, which company have. Then we are going to talk about Microsoft uh, Teams governance and our project Create a Team App. So how we drove our governance in BOSAR. So uh, here on the next slide, we can see yeah, just a short information about us. So here with me today is my colleague Nico. Nico Fernbach, who uh, is employed in Bozart for uh, around five years, and he is modern workplace team lead. Before coming to Bozart, he also has experience working as a consultant. Hi, Nico. Hi, Gorana. Thank you so much. Um, also looking forward to today's session. I'm proud to present this uh, kind of, yeah, as Gorana said, success story about how we manage um, the team's governance together with Yakorana, you know her. She's um, MVP, MCT, and I'm happy to have her um, as part of my modern workplace team as Microsoft 365 specialist, as she yeah, brings a lot of um, experience. I think it was almost uh, over uh, 15 or 16 years in IT. Thank you, Nico. Good. Um, let's quickly start with um, Bossart. So Gorana and I, we both work for the company Bossart. Um, Bossart is a, yeah, I would say modern and cool company to work for. So it's not only the leading way uh, we do in fastening technology and logistic solutions, but also I would say a great place to work. Bossart was founded 100 years ago with um, yeah, the headquarter in Switzerland. Today we operate um, in over 80 countries worldwide and are still family led in the seventh generation. Um, so what does Bossart do in a nutshell? Because that's not the reason why you joined the session. Bossart actually provides fastening technology and innovative services like smart factory logistics, smart factory assembly that help our customers um, optimize their production processes and increase their efficiency. So we offer a variety of also exciting jobs and career opportunities. So if you're looking for a modern cool company to work for, um, I highly, highly recommend checking out um, our website. You can scan the QR code. So um, our user experience in Microsoft 365 so, so we will bring you a bit of a background um, where we came from, where we are. Uh, so we went live, so Bossart went actually live in with Microsoft 365 in 2016. So two years after Microsoft launched Office 365 to that time. And um, all services were available without governance, including OneDrive, SharePoint, Office, you name it but mostly for the end users impacted with Outlook and to that time, Lync. And today we find ourselves in, I would say a bit different situation. So I joined also Bossart five years ago and um, it has taken us until now to think about governance and cleaning up decisions that have been made or not even have been made. So currently we have around 
3K Office Enterprise E3 licenses and around 200 um, F3 licenses for our, we call them modern frontliners, connected with the same amount of EMS, so enterprise mobility and security license. But, however, in terms of adoption, we can now say we facilitated almost all M365 apps in a, I would say, yeah, more or less governed way. Gorana. Yes, definitely. So this um, topic that Nico mentioned that we did not have uh, governance, I think that it's pretty much common topic for many, many companies and customers of Microsoft because um, I also in the past saw users which just wanted to get into the cloud, start using services without any particular plan or how they're going to do that. And suddenly they found themselves in a situation where they have unsatisfied employees. They don't know where the data is stored. The users don't know actually when to use what, which tool to use in which situation. And then they get frustrated to the service which is actually pretty bad because Microsoft 365 delivers so, so much about the collaboration and communication, and um, but it needs to be driven on a, on a good way. So the users need to understand the benefits of having the services like this and have a clear picture. So it's not just IT, it's both ways. So we need to have definitely a good approach where to find the data, what to use, when, and what type of restrictions or permissions we are going to have regarding, of course, the uh, our regulations within our organization. Um, okay, so when we speak about this, we speak about the governance. So let's start from the beginning. What is governance? So it's an approach. It's actually an approach how we are going to use the services, how, which approach we are going to choose to manage the processes, the users, the devices, everything, the data within our environment. But at the same time, we ensure security, but also an optimal way how the users can work. So we say optimal, not higher security. So we just lock everything and the users cannot work. But let's see which uh, level is optimal for our organization. And we know that every organization is different. We have small companies, mid-sized enterprise businesses. We have different types of users with different types of usage, different types of departments. So uh, governance is just not one size fits all. It needs different approach in different case scenarios. So, uh, but there are some common things and this is like, keep it simple. So this is, a thing that everybody should consider when we speak about governance. So keep it simple and keep it clean. Use the services on an optimal level. And of course, not every organization can use every service in Microsoft 365 and every, for example, security, the retention, the um, data loss prevention, or you cannot use everything, but you need to optimize what you are going to use in your environment and then have clear roles. Who is responsible of which point of which part to manage this governance? And the last but not least, remember that this is a process. So governance is not something that we need to um, establish now and we forget about it. No, it's something that is a process, it goes on and maybe in some point it needs to change so to adapt to the changes, to the requirements of the business, et cetera. So that's in general about uh, the governance. What is and when to use what? So about SharePoint online governance. So let's go a little bit deeper into, into this topic. What used to be situation in Bossart, but also I think that in many, many customers. So when we speak about sharing of uh, SharePoint data, folders, files, and sites, uh, there is a space in the admin center which goes together with OneDrive, and as you can see on the, on the uh, slide on the left side, and it has different levels of permissions. 
So here we had anyone can share, which is a really not very best practice. If you give an access to anyone from the organization to share the files with everybody out of the organization without uh, the need for authentication. So if I share something and then maybe the person with which I shared that file reshares the link with someone else and then they can share and I don't know at, at the end where that link ends. And of course, there was um, a possibility to set up, for an example, expiration date. So the link will expire in seven days and it's a good approach, set a password, block download, etc. But actually, at the end of the day, the most good thing would be to lose this anyone. So go one level lower, do not do most permissive one, but just to guests to must to sign in. So you know to with whom you are sharing uh, the documents. And of course, the expiration date still stays here. So no site creation service anymore. We have locked this down so the users are not able to create the sites by themselves. This is a good approach, especially in larger organizations where we have a lot of users and we drive the awareness of the usage of the tools, but we are just not sure where the people are with the knowledge in some point and if they are aware if they should or should not create some site. So this would be a good approach. For an example, if you are a larger organization and you would like to restrict the SharePoint creation of the sites. This is why is it important? Because it's not just a SharePoint, but when you create, for an example, a SharePoint team site, then on the background you have a group created which is connected to this SharePoint team site. And then we, maybe you will have users which will create some sites and tests and uh, some space which is uh, not very important for collaboration. And you would like to give that just um, a little bit more of a control. So uh, that's a little bit about our SharePoint uh, governance and about our Power Platform governance. Nico will say a couple of more words. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, you know, you, you all heard of Power Platform, right? So and it has been launched a couple of years back and um, we really somehow also struggled with capabilities and readiness to the market because a lot has been promised but not delivered. Um, and but finally, uh, to my point of view, um, we can now say with the whole Power Platform suite, uh, we will accelerate business productivity with low code apps and enhance automation or even hyper automation. And everyone is now screaming for AI and so on. And so we can also target to implement uh, tools like AI Builder, which is part of um, Power Automate or connected services around like um, Syntax or Azure Forms Recognize. So all the technology is becoming um, really huge and um, business is eager to create things on their own. So they request apps from us almost every day, right? Automation um, services and stuff like that. So in terms of governance, we have um, to now make sure the path is being made for the breakthrough technology and for the future. Um, as a result, um, um, we are in between of a couple of Power Platform governance initiatives and we figured out that um, establishing a um, environment strategy is key, right? To have a, to at least cut down possibilities to not let people create environments without an approval on their own. Of course, data loss prevention rules are necessary and also licensing is a huge topic, right? So all that has to be considered. And um, what we see is that we can scale only technology with the adoption of and with um, our ambassadors and um, citizen developers. Otherwise we cannot scale and otherwise we cannot accelerate um, automation of repetitive tasks and also self-created almost low code apps in Power Apps. But last but not least, uh, we see it on the right corner. It's a screenshot of the center of excellence. So we made great experience that supports the governance with the center of excellence. Um, you can Google it. 
center of excellence, you can install the toolkit. It's really well uh, documented by Microsoft and it's free. It gives you such a great overview about um, app creators and stuff like that. Good, other than that, I hope we cover all, yeah. Um, we have Viva, Engage, but also Stream. So, and Viva Engage, that was to that time uh, Yammer, they, Microsoft renamed that, they are re really good in renaming. Um, we use Engage as one of our internal social collaboration channels with now a new community governance. We also stopped, and that comes to Microsoft Stream, adding stream recordings to classic stream. So if you have Microsoft Stream in place, you have a lot of videos on stream, we would recommend when it comes to governance to at least limit the uploading of Microsoft Stream, so uploading to classic stream, and to give also um, a bit of a hint to your users that you don't use, or users please don't use the classic stream anymore, go to modern, which is based on SharePoint and OneDrive. So I assume we have done a lot in governance, but also in adoption. So I, I would say without adoption, technology cannot be facilitated, right, Gorana? Definitely. So the one thing is what we do from the admin aspect, but the other thing is what should we do and how we drive the user adoption. So the users need to be aware of the changes and the possibilities. So actually what we do is, I don't know why I cannot click on the slide here. It's like, um, do you want me to click? Yes, please. To the content. Okay, thank you. So uh, actually how we drive our user adoption in, in, in Bossart. Uh, we have uh, a group of people which are enthusiasts, so these early adopters, and we call this program ambassador program. So they are modern workplace ambassadors, and uh, they are our employees in every business unit around the world. And uh, they are enthusiasts who would like to test and to see uh, the new things coming and the changes we do. And these people are actually our uh, maybe first and pilot group for, for testing the changes. And then they are also our support when it comes to the other uh, users in their business units. So they're point of contact in their own business unit for help and for support. So that's uh, the first thing about Modern Workplace Ambassador Program. And the second we do is we drive um, Modern Workplace Podcast, which is once a month on Friday. And we have uh, two different uh, English and German sessions. They um, last for half an hour and we have uh, covered every single time the news and the updates coming soon. Or if there is nothing interested to be to be said, the upcoming thing that we do it with tips and tricks to to support our colleagues. So we want to make sure that every time we have something um, interesting to say to to our users. And then, uh, of course, we have um, here the adoption score, which we follow. So we just want to see how uh, the adoption journey in our organization um, is developing. And uh, we, of course, use our uh, intranet to communicate with our colleagues and to um, give them insights and um, guidelines, tips for the different topics. For example, here you can see that we shared the Power Platform Roadmap, Ignite or public teams, shared channels, etc. So everything that we find interesting about the users, we drive on our on our internet and also in our uh, Yammer community. So that would be about the user adoption. But is is that all? Yeah, I mean. Um... Almost. No, I mean, all employees basically um, screamed for more governance because, as Gorana said, it's like 
everyone was saying the same too many tools like where's the data and stuff like that but um in the end um we thought um our employees are happy yeah we have herlinda here on the right she she might be happy but there's still someone from it that's um noah right and noah um was asking hey what about microsoft 365 groups and we were like oh yes he is right and actually microsoft 365 group if you haven't heard of that um it's it's basically the basis the technology basis of a lot of tools behind microsoft 365 we can also call it like a cross application membership service in microsoft 365 and in a basic level um m365 groups is an object in azure ad right and with the list of members and uh, coupling to related workloads that you see here in the circles including sharepoint team sites um, sharepoint a shared exchange mailbox a planner a onenote notebook and so on and you can add or remove people to the group just as you would um, for any other group based security object in ad and for most cases our employees create a m365 group out of a team in microsoft teams which in the end led us to the discussion how can we finally regulate the team's creation process so um I think we, we heard a lot about limitation, blocking business in doing something. And um, so how, how does it fit? We have guiding principles. How does it fit to our guiding principle, uh, we empower? And of course, you heard a lot about those kind of buzzwords that came up uh, frequently, like limitation, stopping business of ability to do something to create something and governance and such boring stuff right we are in a cool world, world where we can use microsoft 365 tools and we can facilitate them so governance is like a topic that comes not so good um but now in today's presentation we will show you how we then within bossart have developed in our op opinion the last part of the puzzle of um governance so actually a smart process for people to create a team in microsoft teams without limiting business productivity and and that's more the most important point confirming the teams creator prove their knowledge about the tool microsoft teams but before we start with that explanation and the process i would like you Gorana, to give us a hint about our current microsoft teams environment Sure, I will do so. So uh, I will start with this slide, which will show you. And it's that again. Yeah. Okay. Um, about yeah, how did we start? That actually, what did we saw in the past in um, our environment, which drove us to start this project about the teams governance, especially. Here on this slide, you can see how many groups existed. And actually, in the middle of the screen, you can see the orphaned groups. So the orphaned, inactive groups, etc. And there were many, many groups which had the name test in it. So test, test one, test one, two, three, test training, test 10, etc. And the people were just opening tests and they were just existing as a group there. Also, we saw many teams which um, were ownerless teams or teams groups, actually, which had just one person in it. So let's say I'm opening a team because I need a place to store my documents and I'm alone with it in the team. So it's just uh, not a good approach, not, not a best practice. So this is a print screen how, how it looked like in our environment before we of the uh, team's governance and before we did our create a team app project. So yes, a lot of orphan teams. And now a question to you, do you track the ownerless teams? So here is one QR code, which you can um, scan with your phone and you can vote. And 
check and see the results. I will maybe give you one minute to open the scan and Maybe I should share the screen so you can see the results for a moment. Okay, here we are. So we have 60% no, but we've planned to, and occasionally, okay, 50 50. Six people voted. So no one is voting for all the time, oh, actually. Yeah. Okay, then uh, Nicole, you can you can take yeah. the control again, and yeah, thank you everyone for the vote. So it's interesting to see to see this approach um, how we and how how we all actually uh, track this. And now let's talk about the team's governance principles. So some of the questions we need to ask ourselves. So when we started this project, we asked ourselves who is able to create a team? So because the person who creates a team creates a group in the background. So who is able to create a team? And uh, in the past, uh, I saw uh, uh, companies which are uh, with uh, approximately the same amount of users, which restricted the creation of teams. So just one group can create a team. So let's say just the ambassadors can create a team or just the administrators can create a team. So we didn't want it to do this because the users in Bossart have this habit to be able to create a team and suddenly not be able to create can be frustrating for some of them. So the next thing, do we need a naming convention? So if we say yes, we need, and we if we do that from the admin center, maybe there are people who will be uh, feel, who will feel forced to to do the prefix or suffix. And there is a case when teams are created for international purposes and not just let's say for for the business unit itself, so they can get confused when to use this prefix or suffix. And uh, do we need an expiration of groups after some time of period? This is, I think, very good and nice question, which we covered actually in the in the past as well. So in Bosart, we have six months of expiration policy set up in Asia. So we are sure that the the uh, space in the admin center is clean. And another questions that we need to ask ourselves about retention policies. Are, is the data um, important for us to be kept in some period of time? And what shall we do after that period of time? Then another question is if we would like to restrict some applications or some features. So, and if yes, is it going to be done on, on a level of uh, organization level or a group level or uh, anyway? And then how will we monitor the activities and processes? Because we said it's a process, it's not one one time job, but it's something that develops. So how we are going uh, actually to, to monitor everything. So about the team's governance in Bossart, I mentioned that we have the expiration policies and we also include blocked words. So uh, for an example, we have a list of words that the users cannot use like uh, CAO, et cetera. And we have also a whitelisted domains. So the communication within our Teams environment has a list of domains which with the companies which we collaborate frequently, and we have set up that in our admin center. Of course, everybody was able to create a team and everyone was able to create a group. So we wanted to make a change everyone to create a team 
but we wanted to be sure that the people will have the right knowledge to raise their awareness that they need to create a team with a purpose. So when is the right time to create a team and how long should I keep the team and what should I do in what scenario? So during the team's governance that we establish, we have a communication with the users. So this is something that we spoke in our team. And after that, we communicated with our ambassadors. So we get the feedback from the business units, from our ambassadors, uh, how they see this, govern this um, governance, especially for the teams and for the creation uh, process. So we used, yeah, the ambassador program, but we also faced some struggles. Yeah. Nico Here we have speak about Helinda struggles. again. Right. <laughs> what was that, Gorana? Yeah, you, you speak about the struggles. <laughs> yeah. I always have to speak about the struggles. Why, by the way? <laughs> <laughs> no. Um yeah, here we have we see we see Helinda again. And um at one point I went to the office and saw her and she wasn't really in a good mood. I asked her, Hey, what's up, Helinda? She said, I know you have done a lot in governance, but still I'm struggling. I said, okay, Helinda, let's meet at one after lunch. Please prepare the points you're struggling with. So I thought, okay, even though we have such good, I assume, good governance best practices that uh, Corana also mentioned now in place with the blocked words and stuff. Um, Helinda said, yeah, hey, well, guys, we still face following issues. We still have wild growth in our data because of similar teams with same use cases being created, right? So people just don't speak, they just create their teams um, because of also misuse teams that are being created. So um, it's a huge, when you have misuse teams, there's a huge chance of, of also data loss, right? So also security approach um, and wrong awareness <laughs> when to use what? Gorana, you've mentioned that. Um, when to use SharePoint, when to use OneDrive, when to use Intranet, which is based on SharePoint, Teams, technology behind Teams. End users, they just have to work. They, they don't, don't think about things techno technology-wise. They just need tools uh, from the tool uh, landscape for their daily work, right? And in the end, and that was what we heard a lot. Um, we have still way um, too many teams. So in the end, we thought about how can we bring in more governance and adoption without limiting, again, the productivity of the Herlindas we all have within our company. So I would say we go into the solution. We have created a Canvas Power App jump into the GIF. It's just a GIF. So, and I will jump to the live demo really soon. So we've created again a Canvas Power App, which is called Great Team App. The app is directly pinned to the left side navigation of Microsoft Teams. So everyone has it. And usually users then can start with creating their team within the app. But before I jump into the demo, I just quickly uh, present you the, the whole process. So the workflow behind. The beauty of the solution here is that before a user can start with creating a team, the user must prove their knowledge within our e-learning. So we use LMS 365 as our e-learning solution. So there's a course they have to take it, they have to prove their knowledge. And in the end, once they have done it, um, the user will become part of a security group. So Power Automate is behind. So there's a Power Automate workflow. The trigger is when a course um, has been completed within the LMS 365. So there's connections and uh, within LMS 365 and Power Automate. So when the trigger has been set, an action takes place and takes the user into the specific 
security group, which enables them to create the team within the create a team app. Again, it's a Canvas Power app. Um, and once the user went through the process of creating the team, a workflow again is being created with the button create, which is like also the trigger. And finally, the user um, can create as many teams as he wants and can start with more trainings within the LMS if, if yeah, rele relevant, I would say. So you see a lot of technologies behind that you that we have in place, maybe except of LMS 365, you can of course use different technologies. Uh, for that case, you can, if you could use for, for instance, Microsoft Forms to track or check knowledge and combine that uh, within um, a stream recording with a, a smart um, e-learning. So you can use completely out of the box solutions for the whole process. And it's free as we use as data back and not data worse. We use Microsoft uh, lists for that. And um, so no premium services and connectors are required. And in the end, it's all the provisioning services within um, security groups in Azure AD. So that's technically speaking. Um, Maybe we should, we could now ask for, before we jump to the demo, because I heard from Gorana, we have a bit more time. Are there any questions before we jump to the demo? Seems no. So, okay so far. Actually, yes. If I can, of course. Yes, you can. Well, uh, Gorana said that uh, the best approach for uh, governance of, of teams and everything else in Office 365 is keep it clean and simple. But tell me what uh, the administrator's team can do if we haven't been keeping it clean and simple and we can't turn back the tide. So what is the advice when we have uh, hundreds and hundreds of teams that are unmanaged or Un, un, unused anymore because I, I work at the faculty and uh, when the pandemic started uh, the, we, we, we were thinking about the governance but then we, we said that in, that in a situation where we have uh, several thousands of, thousands of students and uh, 200 uh, professors uh, it is Im impossible that, that in short time we can enable the and uh, put the governance in in place. So so basically, what can we do after three three years of using Teams and a lot of Teams and uh, everything else? Is there a guidance or something like like that? Juana, you want? Oh. Yeah, sure. So. Um... I don't think that there is a speed process about cleaning. It's always much easier when you start from the beginning and um, set up the full environment from, from the first moment. It's always harder when you have established something and you want to change it. I think that it's a case of for, for everything, not, not just uh, for, for the governance of the teams. But um, my advice would be to first to start with this expiration policy, so see what is not used anymore. So after some period of time, it's if a group is not used to be deleted automatically. Um, you can also um, go through um, limit the creation of the groups. So maybe just the professor groups can can create the teams and not the other people who are out of that group, or you can group you can create also a group of um, like we have the ambassadors in our company, uh, the ambassador students, which will be supporting the whole process. So these are just some 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 ideas that mm -hmm. just came on my mind, which which you can do. So mm. it's it's keep uh, clean and simple. It doesn't mean that you need to have just two teams and. Uh, yeah, everybody to be a part of that teams and we it's clean and simple. We have just two teams, but clean and simple. How do we drive the process? So don't use everything because sometimes also the services can uh, get in conflict between each other. So just choose what you will use. Try step by step and clean the space. What is used, what is not used. So for 
if my personal opinion is starting with the expiration policies and deleting all of those things which are not used maybe more than six months. Thank you. But that, that's, that sounds great. Thanks. Thank you for the question. Yeah, great question because it, it actually, um, we, we've been in the same situation. So we, we've implemented all the governance topics directly after COVID came up, right? So it, it, it for us, the adoption was great because everyone screamed for a solution like Microsoft's uh, Teams. And like Orana said, I just can confirm that I think it's also general recommendation by Microsoft to start with the expiration policy because um, they are now based on activity. That means it's, a team doesn't just expire after we have 180 days. Um, it renews when there is activity within the team. So that's beautiful because um, when there is like 180 days without activity within a team, and that can be even just a click within a channel, um, then the team will be renewed and renewed and renewed. So it's a smart way of adaptive governance and um, owners will be notified when the team is going to expire three times. I guess it was 30 days, seven days and a day before a team is going to be deleted. And um, then owners will be notified. And that's also the second point um, Gorana mentioned uh, before in the presentation about the orphan teams. And we, we faced that point at, I think it was six, over 60 orphan teams or even more. And uh, we need to really get rid of the orphan teams, not of the, sorry, not of the teams, but to at least get in touch with members of the team to define new owners and ask them, hey, do you need the team anymore? Um, or do you, what, what's the use case of the team? So, and to reduce the amount of teams with orphan um, team owner, that would be also an approach. I thought that, that uh, you, that you was going to say that, uh, that, uh, you are going to uh, that you want to get rid of the users, <laughs> but we didn't say the say say that. And and uh, Nico, can you can you tell me one one thing? Is there a PowerShell script or software or service or uh, maybe a Power Automate flow that would uh, see the activity of the teams and if they and and if they are past 180 days to automatically download the content of the of the files. Uh, of the of of the of the of the storage section, and to uh, to first to notify the owners to download the 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 content and to to uh, create a CSV, CSV uh, list of the users, so that uh, if we are past 180 days, it is aut automatically done. But if a user wants that back or some kind of a backup, that we are fully fully covered. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I don't know if that is a custom made or a, or a solution that can be bought if it can can be bought. I, I, I actually I don't know it, but I'm I assume because um, Microsoft also works like in the background with the technology that you can get with the Office Graph. Um, uh, you can get all the information of the activity that you would need, and then you could take even uh, either a script or a PowerShell that runs let's say once a, uh, once so scheduled flow once a day to check about activity within a team and then you can um, build your own workflow based on exactly what you said i think the actions out of that you you can you can do right so the exports and stuff um that's manual work i just think because what you can you, what you could buy would be like tools like sharegate so there's governance tools. Um, we use ShareGate for migrations. You can also use ShareGate. That's the Aprico um, app. That's called the program is called Aprico within ShareGate. Actually, it's a governance tool where you ac exactly see also teams that um, have no like activity anymore, and you can there define a hey, my retention, uh, my expiration policy would be not 180, it would be 90 days, and then please inform the owners. And there's even an Aprico bot that can send uh, messages to, to your users. So I, I'm not sure if there's a PowerShell that you could take. We don't use it, 
we use uh, for that or we could use. We don't do it quite a lot for now, to be honest. Um, ShareGate. But what we have done with the orphan teams, we took them, um, took the members, and they could then define of their membership what they have. So of the uses of the members, a new owner. And not only one, but two, because that was also one of our new policy that we say, OK, uh, we don't allow only one owner anymore. We want to have two owners. And and um, even, I mean, technically speaking, it's not possible to have orphaned uh, teams, right? But if a user, um, an owner leaves a company and there is no second owner, the, the license will be removed from the first owner uh, or from the unique owner. So the team is becoming ownerless at one point. Okay, thank you for all the great input. Thank you for the great questions. Good ones, yeah, really good yeah. ones. Any more? <clears throat> so I will jump to the demo. I, I share my screen and you see I'm in Microsoft Teams in the web app because it's uh, for me now more performant but it's the same use case for the client. I have a demo account. It's our modern workplace, a modern work account we use for testings, for trainings and so on. And what you see is the create team app on the left corner. Usually, but now because I can, because I'm the modern work uh, user, you cannot create a team from the default create team button under teams. That is usually hidden, but as we use the account also for some uh, testings, it can be done, but for end users, they don't see and they don't have the capability of creating a team from here anymore. They just can it. Uh, this can be only done with the create team app. And as I am new at Bossart, I get this warm welcome to all Bossardians uh, screen, and it shows up a message that I cannot create a team. I can either go to the ambassadors, it's a link, which shows us an overview of um, all the ambassadors we have within the Bossart group, so within the business unit. So let's assume I live, I work in Switzerland. I can go and watch out for the ambassador of my department, ask him, hey or her, can you create a team for me? They know what they do, they know the technology and so on. That's what a new employee can do, or they can go to the e-learning. Let me open it again. And you see it's based or completely integrated in SharePoint. That means the technology behind LMS 365 is embedded to SharePoint. It's just a simple SharePoint app. And um, as a new employee, I have to and I can go to the course of create a team app. Let me quickly authenticate myself. It's starting the e-learning and I can read through some content. You can embed everything that you want. It's just a lot of text within this way, but more important is the tutorial, um, which is a video and it explains the process of um, using the Create a Team app and when and how we want to let users um, facilitate Microsoft Teams. The video, video can be customized a bit. I don't know, have you heard the system audio? No. no. Okay, I cannot enable it, but... Did you share it with, when you share yes, the screen? Yes, I actually do, but... It doesn't allow, but quick, let me change from my Chapra. So. Actually, I cannot share my computer audio at the moment. Yeah, on the right side, on it says right. mute. Yeah, the, where the little speaker is. I now. know, I know, but do you hear it? No. No. Yeah, because 
actually I have a, I have an issue on my Microsoft Teams. I cannot um, I cannot click that button here. Mm -hmm. It doesn't allow me to click the include computer sound button. So, but it, that's not crucial. You see Kurana here and Natalie, both in my team, and they explain a bit uh, of um, how to use Microsoft Teams and when to use what and uh, how to work on files. It's it's a simple um, but really well done awareness video and use adoption video. Now you can take whatever you want. It takes um, nine minutes. It's long, but long enough to explain a bit the use case of Microsoft Teams. And once you've done the video, you have to go through a knowledge check. It's six or seven. Now it's seven questions, um, which I would just uh, quickly go through. Why does a team always needs at least um, a second owner. Please select all the answers to check the work of the first owner to manage the team if the first team owner is not available or to keep being informed about the team activity. I choose the second one. How many team owners do we recommend? I said that at the beginning, we recommend to have at least two because of the reasons of the orphan teams. And that is mandatory field actually into mm -hmm. the create a team app. So you cannot go further create a team if you don't um, choose second owner. Yep, exactly. Um, who can see the content which is shared in a private team? Um, it is everyone who is invited to be part of the team. It seems to be a simple uh, question, but we, we faced a lot of um, Public teams also at the moment where people just don't know the difference between public and private team. Um, so again, a bit of awareness of um, the team's options they have. Then we ask, uh, your team has 50 team members and you would work on a project with just four of these team members. You need a space where you can schedule weekly meetings and store the recordings automatically. You also need to share files with these members. What is the best option? Create a channel in an existing team, use Outlook or create a group chat. I use a channel in an existing team instead of creating a new team or sharing stuff with OneDrive. If I know people of my or users or colleagues of my team that are within my team, right? then just create a channel. What types of uh, roles are there available within Microsoft Teams? Team owner, team member, and guests. That's the right answer. That's just the three types of roles in Microsoft Teams. What should I do if I'm part of a team which I don't need anymore? So if I don't need the team anymore, I'm part of that team, I just leave the team. That's the right answer. And the last one, no, six out of seven. With two members of your already existing teams, you need a space to collaborate confidentially on a particular topic which can have a long-term duration. You are going to create private channel in an existing team. So um, here we see also a bit of awareness what we've explained in the tutorial about um, what kind of channels can be created, like what's the difference between standard, private, um, and also shared channel, right, which is new and which is also a topic to be governed and adopted in the end. Good. Congrats, I passed. Wow. So I have 100%. We said, okay, the passing score is 80%. So um, a couple of the questions have to be answered. I have a green check mark. Um, on all points, let's assume I have done a good job and I'm well adopted as a new employee. Now I should at least know what is technically speaking behind a Microsoft team. And now the workflow is running. So as I've completed the training here, um, the workflow is running and takes me into a Azure AD security group automatically. and Let's refresh the app. I don't know if it's done already. 
Yes, it is. So um, after a couple of seconds, you can now go ahead and create your team. You just have to refresh the Canvas app again, which is embedded to the team's um, navigation directly. What we have is three sections. It's first is awareness, second is team information, and the third is review and create. I can give a feedback and I also can switch the language of the app into, let's say, German, because that's part of our um, headquarter. Uh, I just leave it on English. Now I will be guided through a bit. So I will be asked, hey, is this going to be a short or long-term long team? Um, if I select, for instance, short term, I will get a note, hey, when you don't uh, use the team, but you want to keep it because of the content shared in, you can archive a team. So there's a tutorial linked, how to archive a team, how to restore it again, and just keep it for long term. Um, are you already in an existing team with the people you are going to add? So I get a hint, please check with your colleagues. So ask your colleagues, hey, do we need a team? Um, are they aware that there's going to be a team created? I say yes. And um, we give a hint that you could also create, again, a private channel with a link how to create a private channel within a team instead of creating a new one, what will cause also confusing um, yeah, colleagues in the end. So I click on next. Now I can, I should give a team name. I just uh, call it team test, which should be then deleted in the end by us because a lot of test teams have been created. I can also uh, name it my tasks. No, that was a bad joke. Um, but we faced that experience, right? My task for, because I need to um, facilitate um, planner for my to-dos. We've seen all that. Uh, privacy, new members um, must be added to become members of the team. So I say it's private, not public. So it's changing also the description, what is public and what is private actually, and owners. So you see here, that's my account, Modern Work. I can and I should, as um, Gorana mentioned before, you see I cannot click the next button, but I can add Gorana and then I can click on next, right? So now I have two owners. I have guaranteed that we have two owners for that um, team test. I can also add members. I leave it out for now. Not relevant um, for the app. We said it's it's fine. And when I, when I come to next, I see a quick summary and I can click on create to let the workflow run again and to let the workflow, which is a service account, create the team in the back end. Now we have on top of that a pop up, which is saying thank you and so on. And you can hear which um, Gorana also mentioned before, join our podcast. You can you can sign up for the podcast in filling out a quick form, which invites um, the attendee then to our podcast. And also you can become a Microsoft Teams expert, which will guide the user to our trainings about how to use Microsoft Teams. So we have Microsoft Teams fundamentals. We have Microsoft Teams when to use, what in Microsoft Teams, meeting expert and stuff like that. Usually everyone should find a use case specific training for them if they need it. So just a pop up. Um, let's close it. And um, it takes one to three minutes. That's at the moment a bit of a disadvantage of the app to let the team being created. It can be faster and we are working on um, accelerating and a bit um, enhancing the app to let the service account running um, more faster, but usually it's in between one to three minutes until the team is going to be um, created. Let's just quickly go into teams. I go to hidden teams. I see another test team which has been created out of that template. Oh, now I see the team that I've created now within the app. So the second one um, we have created um, together. and 
we see just a simple Microsoft team uh, with the general channel that comes out of the box. But to be honest, we could also extend the team a bit with like predefined tabs. We could add tabs for more training, like websites that are embedded. We could add a folder structure, which is defined per default. We can add more, more channels like a meeting channel, which we, which we also recommend to users to use um, for recordings and stuff like that. We are just at the basic level of the app, right? So we just started with that. And we are looking forward into watching out for, for new um, like enhancements to that app. And what we see here is the logic right, of checking knowledge, having it in an adaptive way. So IT is not behind, it's a power automate workflow. As a user, I can now go ahead and create a team in the same way without going through the e-learning again, but I can take the whole app to another app that I want to govern more. I could take CRM as an instance or any ERP or whatever. You want to track the knowledge before people can access the app. You could do actually really the same because in the end, it's all um, a security group behind that's managing the permission of accessing something. So that's the logic. So, um, Corana? Yes, I really like this process, especially not because we are raising the awareness with the training, but also it's an ongoing process. Every time a person wants to create a team, there are questions and there are these links and tips and the things that the user needs to consider. Shall I create a team or should it be public, private? Second owner must be added, etc. So we also have the naming convention link. So we don't have the naming convention, but we have tips how to name a team, how to choose the team name wisely, etc. So I think that it's very nice. So even though the user forgets something from the training, they always get reminded during during the team's creation process. And yes, uh, the next I would like to mention about the yeah the results we had were. Nico, this is your slide. Would you like to say that the obstacles, but yay, the happiness slide? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think we, we can we can summarize it a bit. Um, we've seen the screenshot before uh, from ShareGate um, where we've seen the orphan teams um, and really also the amount before. I think it was like 10 teams in an average have been created per day. A lot have been deleted again. So the number of newly created teams have been reduced a lot. Um, so we also have no more, almost, to be honest, almost no more uh, ownerless teams, but it still can be the case, but you don't have to clean up as, as much as we've done before. And we have also saved costs. So. Um, Behind M365 Group, we said that within our first slides, um, a lot of resources are being created, right? Also like SharePoint and they, users are copying files and so on. And we use, for instance, um, AvePoint for our third party backup. And I pay per gigabyte, right? And that means if someone is using Microsoft Teams and adding files and forgetting about that, and if we wouldn't have governance in place like the create a team app or the retention policy, in the end, our costs will increase. And let's assume in 10 years what happens, right? So we have huge costs. Uh, finance department won't be really happy. And in the end, I've always want to have um, a happy finance department. Not only them, I want to have satisfied employees. And I think we received quite well feedback from the business. And also we uh, received good feedback from other IT departments that said, OK, hey, wow, that's great. Can I use the technology? Can I use um, the logic behind? And what do I have to pay for it? And I said, hey, you don't have to pay it. We just copy the Canvas app, just customize the app based on your needs and um, just think about the process. So. Um, we think with that kind of whole big picture, we completed the puzzle of the governance in a more more or less um, 
governed way and accelerated user adoption, which is really a key um, for um, yeah, raising the technology within uh, a company. Yeah, so that's at the moment the result, but again, we are working on improving. Um, Gorana. Yes, so thank you, Nico. So uh, that was um, our success story about uh, the optimization of the creation of Teams process, the whole process, because everybody is able still to create the teams, just they need to, to take the training and to get into the group to raise their awareness when to create. And uh, these are some Microsoft recommendations, like takeaways, so uh, about creating your governance plan. So you need on the first step to consider your key business goals and processes. So it really depends of your um, internal uh, rules, the processes, your, your business, what's important for you, how many users you have. Then understand the settings in the services. So what do you have in your hands? And are you using, for example, just a Microsoft approach or you will use also the third party services? Then plan to manage the user access, plan to manage the compliance settings, the communications, and of course, the life cycle of the whole um, the governance process. And on the second slide, we can see here some takeaways, which are our recommendation. So I would start with the first one that I will mention what size does fit all. It's not case for the governance. You will need to take a good and deep look into the current situation and uh, understand everything. So understand your business, but the users, their habits, uh, the processes, the security in the moment. And uh, then that would be the first step to take the, the governance into the next level. And please keep in mind that it's not one way communication. So you will maybe need to adapt, you need to listen, you need to uh, receive the feedback from the users, uh, from, from the users of the services, and you need to uh, include them in every step, step of the governance process. And of course, plan, plan and plan before before rolling out and the first step of the planning would be to create a small test group so a pilot group which will adopt and will test the solution before you roll out it uh, and roll out in the stages so uh, for an example we we uh, roll out, let's say, to our team, then to the ambassadors, and then we go to particular business units, and then we go worldwide. So that is just one example. And of course, be prepared to adapt and to change because it's a process. In some moment, you will maybe uh, have a need to change some of the settings that you have done in the governance process, and that's totally fine. You, we need to to adapt. So yeah, with that, I will. Um, close the session and say thank you for for the attendance and for participation and if you have any questions uh, still we are here to answer them okay thanks for the wonderful session Nico and Gorana it was uh, interesting it's a good thing how you managed to get a grasp on your governance model inside <laughs> and both are the group. Uh, having in mind that COVID usually did not help larger organizations, but nobody's in the office and they, everybody started using Teams and SharePoint and uh, other digital wonders of Microsoft 365. And uh, yeah, I've seen a couple of uh, situations where old tenants have a kind of a spur of the moment <laughs> and get 1000 or something like that groups and then after a while, more than 30% are kind of dead weight there. So understandable, it's a fight. And I can relate with uh, Sergeon and his problems there at the university as well. Uh, yeah, it's it's tough to manage the professors there. It's a lot of ego on, on per square meter there, I guess. Exactly, right. exactly. You, you know my pains, yes, exactly. All right, uh, I don't know if there are any additional questions. It was a good discussion. On this side, the group is quiet. They're waiting for the beer. I should stop the recording now. That's not based on <laughs> policy. There. I need to cut. <laughs> but uh, either way, thank you for being here. It was a great session. Hope to have you some other time as guest as well, or see you on some event as well. It was a pleasure. Thank you very much, everyone, for the attendance and participation.
Have a great evening. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you guys. Take care. Bye bye. 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 bye.